Chapter 16 Abdullah the Pockmarked and the Story of Faraj and Daud. Abdullah, the pockmarked, undersized, fiery little Bedouin who commanded Lawrence's personal bodyguard, although in appearance a dried up stick of a man, is one of the most daring and chivalrous sons of Ishmael that ever rode a dromedary. He would take keen delight in tackling ten men by himself. Apart from his fearlessness, he was a valuable lieutenant because he knew how to deal with unruly members of the bodyguard. Lawrence would urge his followers on with the promise of extravagant rewards, gold, jewels, and beautiful clothes if they succeeded. Abdullah would promise them a sound beating if they failed, and the certainty that he would fulfill his threat carried at least as much weight with the bodyguard as did Lawrence's milder method. As for Abdullah himself, his most frequent boast was that he had served under all the princes of the desert and had been imprisoned by every one of them. The English Sharif's personal bodyguard, consisting of eighty carefully picked men, was the corps d'elite of the desert. All its men were famous fighters who possessed powers of endurance which would enable them to ride hard for a day and a night on end if necessary. They were required to be ready for a raid on the Turks at any moment, and always to keep up with their leader on the trek. No man was accepted who could not, with one hand free, leap into the camel saddle at the trot while carrying a rifle in the other. Taking it all round, the bodyguard was an extraordinary collection of mettlesome, gay-spirited, good-natured scalawags. Its members were devoted to their Anglo-Bedouin Sharif, but to guard against the possibility of a conspiracy among them, never more than two men were selected from each tribe, so that intertribal jealousy might prevent any group from plotting against their leader. Nearly every man in the Hijar army wanted to belong to the bodyguard, because Lawrence took it on all of his raiding, bridge-blowing, and train-wrecking expeditions, stunts which provided much loot and many thrills, gifts dear to the heart of the Bedouin. Then, too, the pay was greater than that given to any of the other volunteers in the Arabian army. Furthermore, they received a liberal allowance for costly raiment, for they spent all their money on clothes, and when gathered in a body, they produced an effect similar to that of an oriental flower garden. A familiar saying among them was that they might as well spend their gold on clothes in a good time, since Allah might take them to paradise at any moment. Among Colonel Lawrence's personal retinue, the percentage of casualties was far greater than among other regular regulars of Faisal's army for they were continually being sent across the desert on dangerous missions. Frequently they were dispatched through the Turkish lines to act as spies, a service for which the bodyguard was especially suitable, since it contained at least one man from each district between Mecca and Aleppo. Lawrence always arrogated to himself more than his full share of these hazardous missions. To accompany Lawrence and his bodyguard on an expedition was a fantastic experience, First rode the young Sharif, incongruously picturesque with his Anglo-Saxon face, gorgeous headdress, and beautiful robes. Likely enough, if the party were moving at walking pace, he would be reading and smiling to himself over the brilliant satire of Aristophanes in the original. Then in a long, irregular column, his Bedouin sons followed in their rainbow-colored garments, swaying to the rhythm of the camel gate and whether they were passing over the sands east of Aqaba or the stony hill country of Edom and Moab, they always sang and jested. At either end of the cavalcade was a warrior poet. One of them would begin to chant a verse, and each man, all along the column, would take his turn to cap the poet's words with lines of the same meter. There were war songs, and songs that caused the camels to lower their heads and move at a faster pace. Often in the verses, the men commented on each other's love affairs, or on the emir Faisal or seedy Lord Lawrence. I wish he would pay us another pound a month. This, decorated with rhetorical flourishes in Arabic, was the theme of the bodyguard song one day. Another time it was, I wonder if Allah has seen the headcloth, which has the good fortune to cover our Lord Lawrence's head. It is not a good headcloth. The Lord Lawrence should give it to me. As a matter of fact, the headcloths that Sharif Lawrence wore were more resplendent than any they had ever seen. His playful sons coveted them.
The harmonic scale of Arabian music is different from ours, so that to Western ears unused to it, Arabian singing sounds like a medley of discords. Yet the Bedouin, delighted in Western music churned out by a phonograph that Lawrence brought from Cairo, its success encouraged a Scotch sergeant in Aqaba to provide some instruments and organize a band. He helped the Arab bandsmen to create an Arabian national anthem and taught them to play Annie Laurie and Old Lang Syne after a fashion. The Scotch airs we could stand for a time, even though every instrument was out of tune and every man chose his own key. But whenever the Arabs practiced their own national anthem around the camp, we preferred swimming and left at once for a deserted island down the gulf for a dip in the surf just below the ruin of a crusader castle where Godfrey de Bouillon and his knights had bathed a thousand years before us. The Bedouin's bodyguard's sense of humor sometimes took the form of practical jokes. If one of their number fell asleep at his saddle, the companion would charge his camel straight at the slumber and knock him off. Whenever their lord left them for a visit to Cairo or to Allenby's headquarters, most of his bodyguard managed to get themselves imprisoned by a mere Faisal as a result of their wild humor and general unruliness. Nobody but Lawrence could handle his devils, as they were called. Once, having just returned to Aqaba from Egypt, he wanted to set out on a secret mission without delay, as he usually found the majority of his personal followers in the lockup. Among the prisoners were two specially daring men named Faraj and Daud. Lawrence immediately sent for Sheikh Yusuf, who's civil governor of Aqaba, and asked what had happened. Yusuf laughed and cursed, then laughed again. I had a beautiful white camel, he said, and one night she strayed away. Next morning I heard a great commotion in the street, and when I went out I found everyone in the bazaar laughing uproariously at an animal with blue legs and a red head. Not without difficulty, I recognized it as my camel. Faraj and Daud were found at the waterfront washing red henna and blue indigo dye off their arms, yet they denied all knowledge of my beautiful white camel. Allah will pardon me for doubting them. Faraj and Daud were well known as inseparable in a land where lonely desert and the need for mutual protection called for close friendship. David and Jonathan were not more intimate than Faraj and Daud, until, as an eastern storyteller might say, there came to them the destroyer of delights and the garnerer of graveyards. Dow died of fever in Aqaba, whereupon Faraj became intensely miserable, and soon afterward committed suicide by helping his camel headlong into the Turks. Occasionally members of Lawrence's bodyguard accompanied him to Cairo. Those thus honored would don their most vivid robes, rouge their lips, darken the hollows under their eyes with coal, and saturate themselves with bottles of scent. Then, bristling with weapons, they swaggered contemptuously past the town Arabs of Cairo, ogling the veiled ladies, buying richly brocaded garments, and causing much excitement in which they reveled. Abdullah, lieutenant of the bodyguard, once traveled with his leader to General Allenby's headquarters at Ramla. While Lawrence was in consultation with the commander-in-chief, the Arab lieutenant roamed off alone. Six hours passed, and did not return. Then Lawrence was informed by telephone that the assistant provost marshal had arrested the fiery little Arab because he looked like a hired assassin who might be prowling around with the intention of shooting General Allenby. Abdullah said the assistant provost marshal had explained through an interpreter that he was one of C.D. Lawrence's sons and demanded a ceremonious apology for having been arrested. Meantime, he was eating up all the oranges in the quarters of the head of the military police. Punishment for the misdeeds of the various members of the bodyguard was difficult, for a nomad Arab can scarcely be imprisoned on his camel, and he cares not for words of reproof. A conscientious beating from Abdullah was perhaps the most effective solution. A common form of punishment among the Bedouins is to throw at a man's head a short dagger, so that it shall chop through the hair and cause a superficial but very painful scalp wound. Bedouins who are conscious of transgression sometimes wound themselves in this manner, and then, with blood streaming over their faces, crave pardon of the person they have wronged. Chapter 17 An Eye for an Eye and a Tooth for a Tooth In Arabia, the Old Testament law of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, still holds good. Complicated feuds drag on for centuries. A murderer can rarely escape the death penalty. It is almost impossible for him to avoid being found by the murdered man's relatives, 
somewhere in the desert sooner or later. His only chance is to relinquish tent dwelling and become a townsman, and since the Bedouin regards people who live in villages and cities as greatly inferior to him, he can seldom bring himself to such an indignity. A peculiar feature of Arabian unwritten law is that for purposes of retribution no distinction is drawn between accidental and intentional manslaughter. If one Bedouin kills another, whether by chance or design, it is customary for him to flee and send regrets and explanations back by courier. Lawrence Bodyguard was involved in an affair of this sort. During a raid, an Arab climbed through the window of a railway station and attempted to open the door from the inside. Meanwhile, some of his companions were trying to batter it open from without. One of them fired his rifle through a panel, and when the door finally was forced, the man who had entered through the window was lying dead. The Bedouin who had fired the shot immediately dashed the crowd, jumped on his horse, and galloped off. Now it is the custom that the slayer may avoid the penalty of death by paying damages if the lost man's relatives are willing to accept money in lieu of life. In this case, the guards collected among themselves a sum of a hundred pounds, which they sent to the relatives, and all was well. The rate of exchange on an ordinary life varies from one hundred pounds to five hundred pounds. This particular fellow was rather a bad lot, and so his companions, the bodyguard, thought one hundred pounds was ample. Sharifs, members of the Prophet's family, have a far higher blood value than other Arabs. Having killed one of them, a slayer must forfeit not less than one thousand pounds, unless he has arranged a bargain price with his victim's family before committing the deed. Lawrence never met a case of treachery against himself among the tribes with whom he established friendly relations, and even among unfriendly tribes he encountered only one serious violation of the laws of hospitality. Alone he had passed through the Turkish lines for a tour of inspection among the enemy camps. He called on a chieftain of the Benesikir, a tribe which had been cooperating with the Turks and Germans. The sheik broke the unwritten law of the desert and attempted to double-cross his guest. He sent a courier to some Turkish forces that were ten miles distant, and in the meantime attempted to persuade Lawrence to remain in his tent. His intention was to betray his valuable visitor and claim the fifty-thousand-pound reward offered for the capture of the uncrowned king of Arabia. But Lawrence's uncanny insight into the minds of Orientals caused him to surmise that there was villainy afoot, and he hurriedly left the Beni Sakir camp. The fate that befell the Sheik of the Beni Sakir is instructive. Although he was one of the leaders of a tribe considered hostile to the Arabs cooperating with Lawrence, his own people gave him a cup of poisoned coffee because he had been treacherous to a guest. The people of the Beni Sakir felt themselves disgraced by the act of their Sheik. The strict observance of the rules of desert hospitality is almost a religion. If in his own district an Arab has a man at his mercy and is about to kill him, the victim can usually save himself by saying, Dakilak, an Arab word implying, I have taken refuge with you, or I am in your tent and at your coffee hearth as your guest. Among the Bedouins, the protection is a sacred obligation. The meaning of this magic word, Dakilak, is one of the points of difference between the nomads of Arabia and the town Arabs of Syria. The Syrian uses it as a variation of pleas, which to a Bedouin is a ghastly breach of etiquette. In the gigantic task that he set himself, Lawrence had to win the adherence not only of the wandering tribesmen, but of the less reliable Arabs of the towns and villages. He accomplished this by taking into account the many differences between the two types, and using correspondingly different methods. The Bedouin is of a pure breed, and today lives in much the same manner as he did three thousand years ago, while Abraham and Lot were wandering patriarchs. The townsman, a mixture of all the races in the East, has many a bar sinister in his racial ancestry. The nomad is a sportsman, a lover of personal liberty, and a natural poet. The villager is often indolent, dirty, untrustworthy, and entirely mercenary. There are even differences in the everyday observances of life. In the form of salutation, for instance, the townsman shows his respect for Sharifs and other notables by kissing the hand, but the Bedouin considers such action undignified, and only performs it when he wishes to convey the deepest reverence. Although Lawrence received support from many town Arabs, it was primarily the Bedouin who, under the guidance of Lawrence and Faisal, carried the Arabian Revolution from small localized beginnings to glorious success. The Bedouin passion for raiding and looting was a valuable asset in the guerrilla campaign against the Turks.
but the true Bedouin is nearly always content with booty and abhors the sight of blood. He will rob, but will not otherwise abuse a stranger. The pure Arabs of the desert belong to a race that is one of the oldest forms of civilization. They had a philosophy and literature when the inhabitants of the British Isles were undeveloped savages. They are one of the few peoples of the world from whom the Romans failed to conquer. Their primitiveness is due to the necessity of leading a nomadic life, as they are obliged to follow their herds from place to place in search of grass and water. They are wanderers on the face of the earth, creatures who trek behind their camels across the sand dunes, who sleep under starry skies, and who live as their forefathers lived when the human race was young. Both the regulars and the irregulars in the Arabian army were paid wages just the same as other allied troops in other parts of the world. They received their pay in gold coin, all of which was supplied by the British government. Lawrence usually had a bag or two of sovereigns in his tent, and whenever a sheet came in and asked for money, Lawrence would tell him to help himself. He allowed them to keep all that they could take out of the bag in one handful. A swarthy, two-fisted, howitot giant dropped in for a cup of coffee and a cigarette one morning. In the richly ornamented language of the people of the Black Tents, he reminded Lawrence of the valuable assistance that he had been rendering King Hussein. Lawrence took the thinly veiled hint, and, pointing to his gold bag in one corner, he asked his guest to help himself. The sheik broke all records by picking up 143 sovereigns in one hand. The nomad tribes are amazed at the sordid lack of hospitality in the towns. They despise their settled kinsmen for their selfishness. In older times, just as today, the Arabs prided themselves on four things, their poetry, their eloquence, their horsemanship, and their hospitality. Among Arab legends are many which glorify and keep alive the tradition of hospitality. One concerns three men who were disputing in the sacred mosque of the Kaaba as to who was the most liberal person in Mecca. One extolled the virtues of a certain Abdullah, the son of the nephew of Jafar, the uncle of Muhammad. Another praised the generosity of Kaib ibn Said. The third proclaimed Araba, the aged sheikh, to be the most liberal. At last, a bystander to end the discussion and avoid bloodshed suggested that each should go and ask for assistance from the one whose liberality he had extolled and return to the mosque, where the evidence would be weighed and the judgment given. This agreed upon, they set forth. Abdullah's friend, going to him, found him mounting his dromedary for lands beyond the horizon, and thus accosted him. O oh, son of the nephew of the uncle of the apostle of Allah, and father of generosity, I am traveling, and in dire necessity, upon which Abdullah bade him take his camel with all that was upon her. So he took the camel and found on her some vests of silk and five thousand pieces of gold. The second went to Kaib and Said. The latter's servant told him that his master was asleep and desired to know his mission. The friend answered that being in want, he came to ask Kai's assistance. The servant protested that he himself preferred to supply the necessity rather than wake his master. So saying, he gave him a purse of ten thousand pieces of gold, all the money of his master's house, and likewise directed him to go to the caravanserai with a certain token, and from there take a camel and a slave. When Kai awoke, his servant informed him of what had occurred. Kai was so much pleased that he gave the servant his freedom, at the same time upbraiding him for not arousing him. By my life, he said, would that thou hadst called me that I could have given him more. The third man went to Araba and met the old sheik coming out of his house on his way to noonday prayers at the Kaaba. His eyesight having failed him, he was supported by two slaves. When the friend made known his plight, Araba let go the slaves, and, clapping his hands together in the name of Allah, loudly lamented his misfortune in having no money, but he offered to give him his two slaves. The man refused his offer, whereupon Araba protested that since he would not accept them, he must give them their liberty. Saying this, he left the slaves and groped his way along the wall. On the return of the adventurers, a unanimous judgment was rendered in favor of Araba as the most generous of the three. May Allah reward him, cried they with fervor. This legend may well be founded on fact, for one sees many examples of this spirit of liberality, a liberality which increases one's admiration for these children of Allah. Lawrence, recognizing generosity to be a cardinal virtue with the Arabs, made it a point to excel them in this as well as in bravery, physical endurance, 
and nimbleness of wit, all of which they so much admire. After the first successes which enabled him to gain the confidence of his own government, he brought caravans laden with presents rich and rare, and bewildered them with a prodigality surpassing even the legends and the classic poems recited round their campfires, and extolling the generosity of the caliphs of old. The Bedouins were all particularly fond of wristwatches, revolvers, and field glasses, so that Lawrence used to take two or three camels laden with trinkets of that sort to give away. He also gave his men from fifty to one hundred pounds of ammunition each day, and they always shot it off into the air regardless of whether they were fighting or not. In most armies, if a man fires off a single round of ammunition without the permission of his commanding officer, he is court-martialed. The Arabs shot at every sparrow they saw, and one day when a false rumor came in to us at Aqaba that Ma'an had been captured by Faisal Chief of Staff General Nuri Bey, thousands of rounds were fired wildly into the sky. Yet the Bedouins who came into the supply bases along the Red Sea coast happened to see a British officer strolling along with nothing but a riding crop or a stick. They would shake their heads, stroke their beards, and say, Mad Anglesi! Mad Anglesi! But if the officer were wandering about with a rifle blazing away at every rock or bird in sight, they would remark in the Arabian equivalent, I say, these blighters are not such silly asses after all. Really, they are quite sane, don't you know? Like the sepoys of India in the days of Clive, the Bedouins refused to clean their rifles with grease made from pork, simply because the Mohammedan religion teaches them that pork is unclean. So Lawrence either had to clean all the rifles in the Arabian army himself, or provide rifles that did not have to be cleaned. He solved this problem by equipping them with German nickel-steel rifles which Allenby had captured on the Palestine front, rifles that could survive a year's service without being cleaned. The freedom of the desert had been his for thousands of years, so naturally the Bedouin is independent by nature. Discipline and obedience are unknown words to him. Probably none of Lawrence's men would have made a high record in the senior examinations at Sandhurst or West Point. But they did know how to fight the Turks, and how to whip them, and they regarded themselves as of equal rank with any general. These then were the men Lawrence had to mold from an inchoate intertribal conglomeration into a large army capable of defeating highly trained and well-officered forces. All the organization had to be improvised on original lines. There was no commissariat department. When the Bedouin irregulars started off on an expedition, each man carried a small bag of flour and some coffee. Every meal was the same. The entire army lived and fought on unleavened bread baked in ashes. The Arabs could eat a pound or two at a time, but Lawrence usually carried a chunk in the folds of his gown and nibbled at it as he rode at the head of the column. The Bedouin looked upon tin food as a dubious institution. One day, when Major Maynard was accompanying us on a journey over the desert northeast of Akava, he handed a tin of bully beef to each of the men with us. They took the meat reluctantly and seemed to regard it as unholy. It was then we discovered how suspicious the Arab was of things in tins, but from religious, not hygienic motives. It is customary for an Arab, when he cuts the throat of a sheep or of any other animal, to say, as he inserts the knife, in the name of Allah the Merciful and the Compassionate. When they opened the tins, they repeated these same words, fearful lest the Chicago Packers had not performed the ceremony according to the law of the Prophet. Apart from a few such formal observances, the average Bedouin is by no means a religious fanatic. He refuses to take notice of the three cardinal principles of Mohammedanism. He never fasts for, says he, we never have enough to eat as it is. He rarely bathes, using the excuse, we have not even enough water to drink. He seldom prays, for he maintains, Our prayers are never answered, so why bother? But with all his looting and his lack of religion, the Bedouin is a man of honor and a man of humor. Chapter 18 A Rose-Red City Half as Old as Time One of the most colorful and romantic episodes of the war in the land of the Arabian Nights was a battle fought in an ancient, deserted city that had been asleep for a thousand years, only to wake to the booming of big guns and the spirited clash of Turks and Arabs. Here, among the immemorial and perfect ruins of a lost civilization, Lawrence the archaeologist and Lawrence the military genius merged in one. To the few travelers who have ventured into that hidden corner of the Arabian desert, it is known as a rose-red city half as old as time, 
carved out of the enchanted mountains of Edom. It lies deep in the wilderness of the desert, not far from Mount Hor, where the Israelites are believed to have buried their great leader, Aaron. The battle took place on October 21st, 1917, shortly after the fall of Aqaba. It was important from a military standpoint because it definitely decided that the uprising against the Turks in Holy Arabia was to develop into an invasion of Syria, an affair of worldwide importance destined to revolutionize the history of the Near East. In this battle, Lawrence and his Bedouins fought the Turks on the same mountaintops from which Amaziah, king of Israel, hurled 10,000 of the inhabitants of the canyons below. Lawrence successfully defended the city against the Turks in much the same way that the Nabataeans defended it against the armies of Alexander the Great 300 years before Christ. He trapped the Turks in the same narrow gorge that resounded to the tramp of Trajan's conquering legions 2,000 years ago. After hearing Lawrence's enthusiastic description of the palaces carved out of living rock where he had camped with his Bedouins, I asked Amir Faisal if he would permit me to do a bit of exploring among the mountains of Edom. He not only granted the request, but gave us a picked band of his wildest brigands as a bodyguard to protect us from robbers and enemy patrols. From Aqaba, we trekked 38 miles through the Wadi Itham to one of Faisal's outposts at Gera. The Wadi Itham is a narrow gorge hemmed in by jagged granite mountains crisscrossed with black lava veins from 20 to 200 feet wide, caused by volcanic eruption ages ago. This weird wadi pours out onto a mud plain which reminded us of the badlands of Dakota and the high plateaus of central Baluchistan. Here we occupied a deserted bell tent for several days before continuing our trek across arid mountain ranges and sandy desert stretches. Up and up we went over a precipitous, rocky, zigzag trail where our camels, time after time, stumbled to their knees. Reaching the summit of the Nagib, the camel track led across the grassy plateau to the battlefield around the wells of Abu al -Lassan. General Nuri Pasha, one of the commanders of Faisal's army, turned out his troops to welcome us. We stopped a few minutes for coffee, and as I left the general's tent, he picked up a princely Persian lamb rug on which we had been sitting, and threw it over my camel saddle, insisting, in spite of all my protests, that I should take it along and use it as a cushion. He also sent me a hippopotamus hide cane presented to him by the king of Abyssinia, with which to guide my dromedary. A few miles beyond Abu el Hassan, a courier from Faisal caught up with us and handed me a letter of introduction from the mir to his commander at Busta. The courier was a swarthy rascal who looked like Captain Kidd, with his flashing black eyes and fierce, upturned mustachios. His red head cloth was embroidered with huge flowers, and his robes flashed as many colors as Joseph's coat. At his belt were a pearl-handled revolver and two wicked-looking daggers. To my amazement, he spoke typical New York Bowery English and dropped such remarks as, Say, Cole, will you slip me to can opener? He informed me that he had lived fourteen years in America as a machine operator in a cigarette factory. He was born in the mountains of Lebanon and his real name was Hassan Khalil. But in New York, he was plain Charlie Kelly. At the outbreak of the World War, he was working for Thomas Cook and Sons in Constantinople and was immediately conscripted into the Turkish army. At the Second Battle of Gaza, he deserted and joined the Australian forces as an interpreter. After serving with the British in Egypt, he was finally transferred to the Hijah army. As soon as we became better acquainted, Charlie told me he was not a Mohammedan, but an R.C., which he explained in a whisper stood for Roman Catholic. But he begged me not to reveal his secret to any of the other members of the caravan, for he feared that he would be killed instantly by some of our overzealous Muslim companions should they discover his apostasy. Charlie Kelly entertained us around the campfire with detective yarns. He had several Arabic translations of Nick Carter in his saddlebags, and said the Egyptians believed Nick Carter to be the actual head of the American Secret Service. According to Charlie, Nick Carter is a bestseller in Egypt, where his exploits are regarded as authentic history. If an Egyptian cannot read himself, he hires a public reader to entertain him with one of these detective tales. Another member of our column was a silent Egyptian with an immobile face that might have been chiseled out of stone. We dubbed him Ramses because he looked so much like the statues of that mighty potentate along the Nile. The rest of our picturesque bodyguard was made up of Lawrence Bedouins.
All these Beau Brummels used cold sticks under their eyebrows and rouge on their lips and cheeks. The Prophet Muhammad is said to have remarked on one occasion that there were two things no true believer should ever lend to his brother, his cold stick and his wife. Every morning Charlie had to help Chase, who was a little man, mount his camel. Practically every camel Chase rode died in its tracks before the end of the journey. He was singled out as the special object of attraction by all the insects of the desert. Several mornings, when we crawled out of our sleeping bags, we found scorpions and centipedes between Chase's blankets. One morning, Chase handed a treasured can of bacon to one of the members of our bodyguard with instructions to cook him a breakfast that would remind him of home, but he ended up by frying his own bacon. As soon as the can was open, the Bedouin cook dropped it in horror and backed off aghast that his Muslim nostrils had been profaned with the aroma of unclean meat. Like all Mohammedans, Arabs will not use pork in any form. They cooked their food in a butter made from goat's milk. That day we passed a flock of white sheep, all of them fat as butter, with thick curly wool and cute little corkscrew horns. A Bedouin shepherd sat nearby on a lump of basalt, strumming an ancient Arab love song on his lute. Some of these uplands of the Hijar are carpeted with barely enough grass for sheep pasture, and a few of the more settled tribes tend flocks rather than breeding camels or horses. One schemer from Baghdad, hearing of the uprising of the Hijar, was farsighted enough to realize that the Allies were bound to take an interest in the affair sooner or later, and that the British gold pieces would supplant the Turkish sovereigns which long had been the medium of exchange along the desert fringe. So from lead gilded over, he made thousands of counterfeit British sovereigns, and as soon as the first gold began coming into the Hijar from Egypt, but before the Bedouins were familiar enough with it to detect the spurious from the genuine, he trucked across the country buying all the sheep he could find. Instead of the normal price of one pound for each animal, he offered two of his counterfeit pieces. Then, before the Bedouins had time to get into Jeddah, Yenbo, and Wei to spend their gold in the bazaars, the Baghdadi drove his sheep north to Palestine and sold them at two pounds ahead to the British army. When the hoax was discovered, he had vanished into the blue. Distances in Arabia are not gauged by miles, but by water holes. The night after our unfortunate bacon incident, just as we had finished putting up our pup tent at Third Water, otherwise known as Busta, twenty Arab regulars came along mounted on Peruvian mules. The mules were camel shy, and as soon as they saw our caravan, they bolted at top speed in all directions, some of them bucking off their riders and disappearing into the mountains of Edom. These soldiers, who hailed from Mecca, sat up all night shouting and singing around our campfire and firing their rifles into the dark. The Turkish lines were only a few miles away, and I had a presentiment that a Turkish patrol would slip up during the confusion and put a finish to the hilarity by scuppering the lot of us. Nothing happened, however, and after trekking eighty miles across country without a single skirmish with the Turks to make the expedition more lively, we came out on the top of a high plateau. Spreading off to the northwest below us were magnificent ridges of white and red sandstone. About twenty miles to the north lay the valley of the Dead Sea, and beyond, disappearing in purple and gray haze, the central Arabian desert. The peaks ahead were the sacred mountains of Edom. Our problem was to penetrate that massive range of sandstone before us. We descended from the high plateau into a valley twelve miles wide that narrowed to twelve feet, a mere defile through the mountain wall. Through this gorge, or seek, as it is called by the Arabs, our camels and horses scrambled over boulders and pushed their way through thousands of oleander bushes, while the Arabs popped away with their pistols at the lizards creeping across the stones. As we, as we wandered through this rent in the rock, we marveled at its beautiful walls towering hundreds of feet above us, at times almost shutting out the sky and on each side aloft and wild huge cliffs and toppling crags were piled. Hassan Morgani, one of our Bedouins, who wore a purple jacket trimmed in green and a pair of cavalry boots that he had taken from a dead Turkish officer, told us that the gorge was the Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses. Charlie Kelly confirmed this with the assertion that it was here that Moses brought the water gushing from the rock. Today, every Arab family in this region has its little Moses. Through the narrow gorge, a brook plunged in and out among the great boulders, the oleanders, and the wild fig trees. 
High above, the sun warmed the tops of slender cathedral rocks to a wonderful rose red. After pushing our way through the gorge for more than an hour, we suddenly rounded the last bend and stood breathless and speechless. There in front of us, many miles from any sign of civilized inhabitation, deep in the heart of the Arabian desert, was one of the most bewildering sights ever revealed to the eye of man, a temple, a delicate and limpid rose carved like a cameo from a solid mountain wall. It was even more beautiful than the temple of Theseus at Athens, or the Forum at Rome. After trekking nearly a hundred miles across the desert, to come suddenly face to face with such a marvelous structure fairly took our breath away. It was the first indication we had that we had at last reached the mysterious city of Petra, a city deserted and lost to history for fourteen hundred years, and only rediscovered during the last century by the famous Swiss explorer Burckhardt. The secret of the enchantment of this first temple we saw lies partly in its position at one of the most unusual gateways in the world. The columns, pediments, and friezes have been richly carved, but it is difficult to distinguish many of the designs, which have been disfigured by time and Mohammedan iconoclasts. At one side are two rows of niches, evidently the traces of ladders used by the sculptors who carved their way down. These artist artisans used a tooth tool that they might get the maximum effect out of the colored strata, which seemed to form a perfect quilt of ribbons and swirl like watered silk in the morning sunlight. Although the temple is wonderfully preserved, it shows the effects of the sand blasts of the centuries. The auditorium within is almost a perfect cube, forty feet each way. The architecture is of a corrupt Roman Grecian style. The temple was carved from the cliff almost 2,000 years ago during the reign of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who visited Petra in AD 131. The desert Arabs who were with me said it was called El Kazne, or the Treasury, because of the great urn that surmounts the edifice, which the Bedouins believe is filled with gold and precious jewels of the pharaohs. Many attempts have been made to crack the urn, and it has been chipped by thousands of bullets. My bodyguard also fired away at it, but fortunately it was nearly a hundred feet above their heads. Colonel Lawrence is of the opinion that the building was a temple dedicated to Isis, a goddess popular during the reign of Hadrian. One traveler had carved his name in letters a foot high on one of the pillars of the temple, but Lawrence ordered his men to polish it up. The city lay farther down on the plain of an oval valley, a mile and a half long and half a mile wide. How populous it was, there is no way of telling, but several hundred thousand people must have once lived there. Only the more insignificant buildings have perished, and even of those some striking ruins remain. The upper part of the valley is the site of ancient fortresses, palaces, tombs, and amusement resorts, all carved out of the solid rock. The lower part was apparently a water circus, where the people indulge in aquatic sports and tournaments. Petra is a huge excavation made by the forces of nature. From the 9,000-foot plateau from which we first saw the mountains of Edom, we had dropped down to an altitude of 1,000 feet when we entered the ruined city. All the travelers who have visited Petra have marveled at the two wonderful tints of its sandstone cliffs. It is carved from rock the colors of which beggar description at certain hours of the day. In the morning sunlight they are like great rainbows of stone flashing out white, vermilion, saffron, orange, pink, and crimson. Time and the forces of nature have played the magician, painting the different strata in rare tints and hues. In places, the layers of rock dip and swerve like waves. At sunset, they glow with strange radiance before sinking into the somber darkness of the desert night. We wondered at times whether we were really awake, or whether we had not been transported to a fairy land on a magically colored Persian carpet. Stairs carved from the rock, some more than a mile in length, run to the top of nearly all the mountains around Petra. We climbed one great staircase, ascending to a height of 1,000 feet above the city to the temple which the Arabs call El Deir, or the convent. A most impressive gray facade, 150 feet high, surmounted by a gigantic urn and decorated with the heads of Medusa. Most of the steps cut into the mountains lead to sacrificial altars, where the people used to worship on the high places thousands of years ago.
An even greater staircase winds up to the Mount of Sacrifice, an isolated peak that dominates the whole basin. On the summit are two obelisks and two altars. One altar is hollowed out for making fires, and the other is round and provided with a blood pool for the slaughter of the victim offered to Dusara and Alat, the chief god and goddess of ancient Petra. One of my Bedouin companions insisted upon taking off his raiment and bathing in the rainwater which had collected in the pool. The average Bedouin needs a little encouragement along these lines, and so we did not reprimand him for his sacrilegious act. Lawrence told me that it was supposed to be the most complete and perfect example in existence of an ancient Semitic high place. Near the altars are the two great monoliths, each about twenty-four feet high, which the people of Petra carved out of the solid rock and used in their phallic worship, one of the oldest forms of worship known to man. The names of these monoliths and the nature of the worship do not admit a description. The mountaintop commands a view of all the surrounding valleys and mountains, as well as most of the ruins of the city. The outlook is sublime. It is a scene to stir in one's heart those emotions which have ever led man to worship his creator. On a peak nearby are the broken remains of a crusader's castle. Further off to the left rises a black lava mountain. On its summit, glistening beneath the burning rays of the Arabian sun, we saw a small white dome, white like the bleached skeletons we passed in crossing the desert between Aqaba and the mountains of Edom. This peak is Mount Hor, and the dome a part of the mosque built by the Bedouins over the traditional tomb of Aaron, high priest of the Israelites and brother of Moses. We spent a day ascending it, and upon reaching the summit found a Turkish flag flying over Aaron's tomb. As a propitiation before any important event takes place, the desert Arabs climb Mount Hor with their sacrifice of a sheep and cut its throat before the tomb of Aaron. Although no news of it reached the outside world of the time, the far-flung battle lines of the Great War reached even to the slopes of Mount Hor. All the buildings of this city have ghosts of elaborate facades, but within their simple and austere, the magnitude and beauty of them even now strikes one with awe. How much more they must have meant to beauty worshippers in the days when the city pulsed with life. Most of the stone is rose-colored when the sun falls upon it, and shot with blue and porphyry. The deserted streets are rich with laurels and oleanders, whose hues seem copied from the rock itself. In fact, the only inhabitants of this rose-red city for hundreds of years have been the countless millions of brilliant wildflowers that flourish in the cracks of the hundreds of former palaces and temples and wind themselves around half-ruined columns. Petra's mighty men and beautiful women have passed on to that undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveler returns. It is indeed a scene to impress one with the evanescence of all life. The worldly hopes men set their hearts upon turn ashes or they prosper, and anon like snow upon the desert's dusty face, lighting a little hour or two, are gone. In the center of the city, surrounded on all sides by temples and palaces and tombs, is a great amphitheater cut out of the base of the same mountain that leads to the great high place of sacrifice. Tiers and tiers of seats face the mountain avenues of tombs. The diameter of the stage is 120 feet, and the theater is the one symbol of life and mirth in all this mysterious deserted city. The laughter and cheers of thousands once rang here across this hollow cemetery of ancient hopes and ambitions. Here thousands of years ago, the Irvings and the Carusos of that bygone age performed and received the plaudits of their admiring thousands, where now are all the gay throngs who occupy these tiers on feast days and watch the games. The lizards are crawling over the exquisitely colored seats tonight, and the only sounds that have been heard in the theater for centuries have been the desolate howls of jackals. Little did the ancient Edomites or Nabataeans imagine that a people called Americans from an unknown continent would one day wander among the ruins of their proud city. It seems no work of man's creative hand, by labor wrought as wavering fancy planned, but from the rock as if by magic grown, eternal, silent, beautiful, 
alone. All rosy red as if the blush of dawn that first beheld it were not yet withdrawn, the hues of youth upon a brow of woe, which man deemed old two thousand years ago. Match me such marvel save an eastern clime, a rose-red city, half as old as time. The presence of Egyptian architecture and symbols indicates that Petra must have been built by a race that had come in contact with the culture of the peoples who carved the Sphinx and piled up the pyramids. Even the desert traditions of nomenclature support the belief that Petra was at some time identified with Egypt. The nomads believed that these rocks were carved by jinn under the order of one of the pharaohs, and not only are they certain that the great urn on El Khazne contains the wealth of the old Egyptian tyrants, but they believe that they actually lived in Petra and call a ruined temple down in the valley Khazra Feron, the palace of Pharaoh. But nobody knows when or by whom Petra was built. Some think that it had its beginnings long before the time of Abraham, and was an old city when the Israelites fled from Egyptian bondage. As we stand there amid the ruins of this forgotten city, we are reminded that when you and I behind the veil are past, oh, but the long, long while the world shall last, which of our coming and departure heeds, as the seven seas shall heed a pebble cast. The region around Petra was known as Mount Seir in the time of Abraham, and it is said that Esau, with his followers, came to this country after he had lost his birthright. We read in the Old Testament about Petra. It is called Selah, which is Hebrew for rock. It is believed that when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, they came upon Petra and asked for permission to enter and rest. But the people of Petra refused, and Israel's prophets predicted its desolation. Obadiah accused it of being proud and haughty, saying, Though thou mount on high as the eagle, and though thy nest be set among the stars, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. In the time of Isaiah it was a proud and voluptuous city, of which the stern old Jew predicted destruction. The Nabataeans, an ancient Arab tribe, conquered Edom, and by 100 BC had created a powerful kingdom extending north to Damascus, west to Gaza and Palestine, and far into central Arabia. Lawrence told me that the Nabataeans were great pirates who smiled or sailed down the African coast and made devastating raids on the Sudan. They had reached a high stage of civilization, did beautiful glasswork, made fine cloth and modeled pottery. They frequently visited Rome and Constantinople. Both King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had employed the Nabataeans, who rivaled even the Palmyrians in organizing a rich caravan trade and made Petra their principal commercial center in Arabia. Antigonus visited Petra in 301 BC and found there large quantities of frankincense, myrrh, and silver. The Greeks, knowing of this fortress city impregnable in its mountains, were the first to name it Petra, which also means rock. Tradition says that Alexander the Great conquered all the then-known world and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. But tradition is wrong. Here is one city that Alexander the Great failed to conquer. Diodorus Siculus tells us that Alexander considered Petra of such importance that he sent Demetrius with an army to capture it. Demetrius tried to force his way into it by the same narrow defile through which we entered. But the inhabitants shut themselves up in their mountain fastness and successfully defied both siege and assault. Although the city refused itself to the visitor who came with the sword, it welcomed him who came with the olive branch. As the capital of the Nabataeans, it rose to its zenith in the second century before Christ. Greek geographers of those days called the land of Edom by the name Arabia Petraea. Under Aratus III, surnamed Philhellene, or friend of the Greeks, the first royal coins were struck and Petra assumed many of the aspects of Greek culture. Even in the Golden Age of Rome, when Augustus sat on the throne of the Caesars, the fame of this faraway city had reached Europe. It was a mecca for tourists from all over the world, and it must have had a population of several hundred thousand souls. It was a seat of arts and learning to which the uh, Praxiteles, the Michelangelos, and the Leonardo da Vinci's of that day repaired.
Its hospitality was a byword among the ancients. It opened its doors to the early Christians, who were permitted to have their houses of worship there, side by side with the temples of Baal, Apollo, and Aphrodite. Petra was to this part of Asia what Rome was to the Romans, and Athens to the Greek. In AD 105, one of Trajan's generals conquered Petra and created the Roman province of Arabia Petraea, but the city continued to flourish as a trade center under the strong peace of Rome. In those days, Petra was the focusing point on the caravan routes from the interior of Arabia, Persia, and India to Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. It was a great safe deposit of fabulous wealth, fortressed by frowning cliffs. Both Strabo and Pliny described it as a great city, but when Roman power waned, the Romanized Nabataeans were unable to withstand the desert hordes. The caravan trade was diverted through other channels. Petra declined in importance and ultimately was forgotten. In the 12th century, the Crusaders under Baldwin I sent an expedition through the locality and built many castles. They were expelled by Saladin. There are many indications that Petra was a pleasant and pleasure-loving city. Its wealthier classes must have lived in luxury, such as even the luxurious East, as not known in many centuries, with its concert halls, its circuses, its mystic groves, its priests and priestesses of many sensual religions, its wealth of flowers, its brilliant sunshine, and its delightful climate. It must have been at the same time the Paris and the Riviera of Asia Minor. But, except for its immortal sculpture and the few casual tributes to it by writers from alien lands, it has not left a single record of its manner of living or handed down name of a single one of its homers or its horses. Rose red there lies and vivid in the sun, a magic city hid in Araby. Of her no ancient legend has been spun, and all her past the silent years of one to the deep coffers of antiquity. About her brooding stillness there blow the scarlet wind flowers as a carpet flung upon the stones. And oleanders grow where in the night the morning jackals go, a prowl through temples of a god unsung. And so she stands, and centuries have kept her old and secret, tragic or sublime. Without her gates what tides of men have swept, within her portals race of kings has slept, this rose-red city half as old as time. Was there no poet's voice to chant her pride? to clare in her magic down the years. No warrior fame to set her valorous stride, no splendid lovers who for love's sake died, gifting to song their passion and their tears. Was there no storied woman's golden face to glimmer down unnumbered years to come, no prophet's vision to foretell her place, mysterious city, forgotten race? Only her beauty speaks, and it is dumb. And so she stands while the time holds jealousy, her old and secret, tragic or sublime. Her sorrows, joys, her strength, her frailty are in the coffers of antiquity, this rose-red city half as old as time. A little more than a century ago, John Lewis Burkhart, a Swiss traveler, who had heard rumors of a great city of rock lying far out on the fringe of the Arabian desert, penetrated the gorge and found once more this wonderful old city of Petra, which had not been mentioned in any literary record since A.D. 536. In the century or more since Burkhardt wrote of his discovery of the rock city in a letter from Cairo, only a comparatively few travelers and archaeologists from the west have visited Petra. The danger of violence from Bedouin nomads was so great that not many had the zeal to attempt it. The lion and the lizard kept the court where Jamshid gloried and drank deep until Lawrence brought his fighting Bedouins into the city of tombs and empty palaces. Chapter 19 A Bedouin Battle in a City of Ghosts The possession of Petra is necessary to the holding of Aqaba, the most important strategical point on the west coast of Arabia, where the great fleets of King Solomon rode at anchor 3,000 years ago. But Lawrence's battle was the first fought in Petra in the last 700 years. The crusaders, with their flashing spears and pennants blazing to the coats of arms of half the medieval barons of Europe, 
were the last warriors to clank in armor through the ribbon-like gorge. Lawrence, the archaeologist, garbed in Arab kit, had wandered over this country before the war and knew every foot of the region from the driest waterhole to the most dilapidated column in Petra. After he had forced the Turks to surrender at Aqaba, he was determined to capture all the approaches to the high plateau, which begins fifty miles inland from the head of the Gulf of Aqaba and crosses Arabia to the Persian Gulf. At the same time, the Turks realized that they must either recapture Aqaba or reconcile themselves to the loss of all Holy Arabia, so they brought ten thousand fresh troops from Syria and stationed them at the various strategical positions on the plateau. But Lawrence was certain that the Turks would never be able to retake Aqaba, because there is only one feasible avenue of approach for an army by land to that ancient seaport, down the Wadi Itham. To be sure, he had marched his own irregular army through the same gorge a few weeks before, but he had caught the Turks napping and swept on an Aqaba before they were aware of the danger. He had no intention of giving the Turks a similar opportunity. The Wadi Itham is one of the most formidable passes in the world for an armed force to enter. It is as difficult of accesses as the famous Khyber Pass between India and Afghanistan. It penetrates the barren volcanic range called King Solomon's Mountains, which extends along the eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba and rises a sheer 5,000 feet on either side of the pass. An invading army, if attacked from the tops of the peaks crowning its sides, would have no protection. Lawrence would have annihilated any Turkish force attempting to advance in Aqaba through the Wadi Itham. From July until the middle of September 1917, the Turks were quiet. Then they made several reconnaissances around Petra in an effort to dupe Lawrence and the Arabs into believing they were going to attack Petra, although the real intention was to advance directly on Aqaba. The last of these three reconnaissances was a gloomy affair for the Turks. Lawrence and his men cut off and wiped out one hundred of the scouting party. Fifteen miles northeast of Petra, an old crusader castle frowns down on the desert from a steep hill of white chalk. It is known as Shobek. Baldwin I, king of Jerusalem, built a great wall all the way around the crest of the mountain in the days of the Crusaders. Both the castle and the modern Arab village are within the wall, and the only approach to the summit is up a winding, precipitous trail. Shobek was still in the hands of the Turks, but Lawrence spies brought him word that the garrison was made up entirely of Syrians, all men of Arabian blood, in sympathy with their new nationalist movement. So Lawrence sent Maloud and ten of his lieutenants to Sobek by night, followed by Sharif Abdel Muin and two hundred Bedouins. The Syrians, in a body, transferred their allegiance to him. Next morning, the combined Syrian and Arabian forces descended the Chalk Mountain and destroyed three hundred rails on a sideline of the domestic Medina Railway near Inaza. They also tried to capture the terminus of the spur where seven hundred Armenian woodcutters whom they wanted to rescue, were at work. But this time the Turks had erected such strong fortifications around the terminus that, although the Arabs and Syrian deserters took the Turkish outposts, they were unable to capture the main positions. The Turks, badly frightened, sent couriers to Ma'an and Abu al-Dasal asking for reinforcements. By weakening the garrison at Abu al-Dasal, the Turks played directly to Lawrence's hands, for as soon as the Turkish reserves arrived, Lawrence called his men back to Petra from the railway. After the desertion of the entire Shobek garrison and Lawrence's bold sortie against the railway terminus, Jamal Pasha, commander-in-chief of the Turkish armies in Syria, Palestine, and Arabia, decided, against the advice of Field Marshal von Falkenhayn, that German Generalissimo in the Near East that before he could hope to recapture Gera and Aqaba, it would be necessary to retake Petra. Jamal transferred a crack cavalry regiment, an infantry brigade, and several organizations of light artillery from Palestine down the Hijar Railway to Ma'an. This was a clever strategic coup for Lawrence. First, the Germans and Turks had to diminish their forces opposing Allenby and the Holy Land. Secondly, they were walking into the trap which had been set for them, because it was Lawrence believed that if a battle were fought by his irregular Bedouin troops in the mountain fastness of ancient Edom, the superior mobility of his army would eventually enable him to defeat any division of methodically trained regulars in the world. Maloud Bey, Lawrence first in command at the Battle of Petra, was one of the most interesting figures of the Arabian Revolt, as well as one of the most picturesque 
He wore very high purple-topped kaffir boots, like Jack the Giant Killer must have worn. Also spurs that jangled musically as he strode about, a long medieval sword and a long mustachio, which he tugged like the villain of a melodrama. But there was no more charming and gallant officer in the whole Arabian army. He was the son of a Bedouin sheik and a Circassian concubine, and from boyhood had been an ardent Arab nationalist. He made a thorough study of modern military science in order that some day he might help to overthrow the Turk, and he even went so far as to spend three years studying at the Turkish Staff College before they discovered his revolutionary leanings and expelled him. Then he went into the desert and became Secretary Ibn Rashid, one of the potentates of Central Arabia. There Malud participated in scores of raids, and earned such a reputation as a fighter that the Turks forgave him his past sins and invited him to return and join their cavalry. At the outbreak of the World War he was raised to the rank of captain, but he was later court-martialed and imprisoned for taking part in a conspiracy against the Sultan. After his release, he fought the British in Mesopotamia and was captured by them near Basra. Eventually he was allowed to join Faisal. He was wounded in every single engagement in which he took part, because he was so foolhardy that he would not hesitate to charge the Turkish army by himself. Jamal Pasha selected Mahan, the most important station on the Hijar railway between the Dead Sea of Medina, as the starting point for three columns comprising over 7,000 men, several units of light artillery, and a squadron of German aeroplanes. One column made the Crusaders' castle at Shobek its base, another came up from the south by the way of Abu al-Sal and Busta, and the third moved direct from Ma'an on the east. The Turks directed the movements of their columns so that they would all converge on Petra on October 21st. In the meantime, Lawrence and his Bedouins were comfortably and safely lodged in the ancient capital of the Nabataeans, behind those mighty rocky ramparts which defied the armies of Alexander the Great. For the first time in many centuries, the silent avenues throbbed with life. Campfires were lighted on the old altars of the gods, and sentinels stationed on the ancient great high places watched for the coming of the Turks. In the vast echoing chambers of the tombs, the Arabs sat around in circles until late at night, telling interminable stories and singing old chants of epic battles. Lawrence himself occupied princely headquarters, the Temple of Isis, al Khazne, the rose-tinted palace at the entrance of the gorge. If he wished, he could have oozed his archaeological imagination and repeopled the gloomy hall with the vision of handmaidens and Isis dancing before the shrine of their goddess. Instead, he sent for Sheik Khalil of Elgi, a neighboring village, and told him it would be necessary to summon all the able-bodied women for miles around to help reinforce his troops. Arabian women may not have gone in for Red Cross work and women's motor corps or canteen service as their western sisters did during the war, but they have always encouraged their men to fight. In the incessant tribal warfare they are often in the rear, encouraging their men with praise, chanting songs of Bedouin heroes, and shrieking words of blame if their own men folk are not gallantly charging into the thick of the fray. A few centuries ago, the fighting forces of the desert always had two or three of their women dressed in resplendent robes to act as standard bearers. This, however, was the first time in Arabian history that armed battalions of women actually engaged in battle. The Bedouin women living in the vicinity of Petra rose magnificently to the emergency. They dropped their butter-making and their weaving and thronged to Lawrence headquarters under the leadership of Sheikh Khalil's wife. No smart uniforms with braid and buttons for the Bedouin Amazons, barefooted with long blue cotton robes, wearing gold bracelets and rings in their ears and noses, they gathered from all quarters to form their battalion of death. Rallying to the call of Lawrence, who had few men at his disposal, they fought with as great valor as their husbands and brothers, and played a vital role in routing the Turks. Lawrence, remembering the stout defense put up by the old Nabataean kings when Alexander's army failed to capture Petra, stationed the Bedouin women at the narrow gorge opposite the Temple of Isis to defend the city. The women were fierce in their enthusiasm and needed no coaching to make them capable musketeers. They hid behind the pillars of the temple, some of them with their half-grown children and covered with their rifles in the gorge, 
which was so narrow that only a few Turks and Germans could march through abreast. The women held their ground and were not even panic-stricken when German aeroplanes swooped down over the rock temples and dropped bombs on the streets, theater, and water circus. They clutched their rifles only the more tightly when one German bomb made a direct hit on an Arabian machine gun, causing the Maxim and its crew to vanish as those spirited away. Throughout the whole battle, Lawrence commanded from the top of the North Ridge. He had with him a force of fifty Bedouin youths who were selected for their speed as runners and who proved most valuable as orderlies. They could sprint like hares and clamber about the rocks with the agility of the oryx. If one had viewed the battle from the Arabian positions and seen only the women and the Bedouin men dressed in every conceivable desert costume, mounted on horses and camels without saddles, and using nearly every weapon invented by man from the dawn of time, if one could have eliminated the modern note provided by the trench helmets and commonplace lead-colored uniforms of the Turks and by their squadron of aeroplanes, one might easily have mistaken the Battle of Petra for a clash between the ancient Edomites and the kings of Israel. Lawrence had only two mountain guns and two machine guns, but with these he held the first ridge five miles south of Petra for over six hours and killed sixty Turks, with practically no casualties on his side. Then, when the enemy attack had fully developed, when the Turks and Germans were advancing straight up the ridge in spite of the fire of the Arabs, Lawrence vacated it and sent half his men to occupy a ridge a little nearer Petra to the south, and the other half to a ridge on the opposite side of the valley on the north. Between his two companies ran the wide part of the Wadi Musa, a mile distant from the point where it narrows down and becomes a mere cleft through the mountain wall south of the city. The Turks, elated at having captured the trenches on the first ridge, were certain that they had decisively beaten Lawrence's forces, so they charged enthusiastically over the summit and down into the valley, thinking the Arabs had surely retired all the way into Petra. Meanwhile, Lawrence and his men were hiding an ambush on the hills of Petra. He permitted at least a thousand of the enemy's troops to push headlong into the gorge before he gave the order to fire, when he had the Turks wedge into the narrowest part of the gorge, near the entrance to the city. One of his aides fired a rocket into the air as a signal for the Arabs to attack. A moment later, pandemonium broke loose the mountains of Edom. The Arabs poured in a stream of fire from all sides. The crack of rifles seemed to come from every rock. With shrill screams, the women and children tumbled huge boulders over the edge of the, onto the heads of the Turks and Germans hundreds of feet below. Those stationed behind the columns of the Temple of Isis kept up a steady fire. Utterly bewildered, the invaders became panicky and scattered in all possible directions, while the Arabs on the ridges continued to devastate their broken ranks. A few minutes before the sun declined behind the rose-colored mountains, Lawrence and Malud Bey sent up a second signal to their followers. Up, children of the desert, shut up Malud. Crouching figures sprang from behind the rocks on all sides. Allah, Allah, came the answer from the throats of hundreds of Bedouins as they swept down the ridges into the valley. The Arabs captured the entire Turkish transport, a complete field hospital, and hundreds of prisoners. One body of over a thousand Turks who succeeded in retreating to Busta in fair order fought their way back several days later to Abu al Hassan and Duman. After the battle, Lawrence slipped through the Turkish lines in disguise and returned with a copy of the Turkish communique describing the battle. It brought roars of laughter for the victorious Arabs. It ran, We have stormed the fortifications of Petra, losing twelve killed and ninety-four wounded. The Arab losses are 1,000 dead and wounded, and we counted 17 British officers among the bodies. The only British officers except Lawrence, who were even in that part of Arabia at the time, were many miles away at Aqaba. Lawrence himself had worn his Arab robes. His losses were 28 killed and wounded. The Turks had made a little error of 972 in their estimate. Gentle Fox here, with a note from the narrator. Chapter 20, The Relative in My House, is a depiction of the situation and behaviors of women in Bedouin culture as perceived by outsiders and by locals in the 1920s. The commentary contained therein badly shows its age and is not politically correct.
If you would be discomforted by such commentary, I suggest that you stop the video here. But we are going to include it for completeness sake as we are recording the whole book chapter by chapter. Chapter 20 The Relative in My House Perhaps the reason why women played such a small part of the war in the land of the Arabian Nights, explained Colonel Lawrence, was because their menfolk wear the skirts and are prejudiced against petticoats. Then, added philosophically, perhaps that is one of the reasons why I'm so fond of Arabia. So far as I know, it's the only country left where men rule. But Colonel Lawrence denies the assertion made by another authority on Arabia that man is the absolute master and woman a mere slave. Although she is the object of his sensual pleasures, a toy with which he plays whatever and however he pleases, although knowledge is his, ignorance and hers, although the firmament and the light are his, darkness and the dungeon are hers, and although his is to command, hers is to blindly obey, she still wields a vast, indirect influence, but one sees and hears very little of her. Arabia is one country indeed where the equal suffrage propaganda of Mrs. Cat and Mrs. Prankhurst has made little headway. Although the king of the Hijaz figures in the cable news, his queen, Gelaleta el Melica, is never mentioned. Amir Faisal attended the Versailles Peace Conference as the head of the Arabian delegation, but his wife, who shortly afterward became the first queen of a new dynasty in Baghdad, did not accompany him. Hussein ibn Ali's capital is one city where European and American diplomatists and their wives are not welcome. Just imagine how dull life in London and New York would become if the customs of Mecca were suddenly adopted. There would be no charming stenographers, no coquettish midnets, no dancing in hotels and restaurants, no charity bazaars, and no feminine politicians. Where we rise when a woman enters the room, an Arab never does. In fact, he will not even eat with a woman, but, of course, she is expected to serve him. When an Arab prince goes out to smell the air on his camel, his wife does not accompany him. In fact, the women of the towns rarely leave the harem oftener than once a week. In Jeddah, for instance, on Thursday afternoon they stroll outside the city wall to the tomb of Mother Eve. But in spite of their secluded lives, many a veiled beauty of Arabia has played a subtle part in politics, and has by no means been satisfied with conquests of love. Many indeed have been the successors to the Queen of Sheba, who by their wisdom as well as their charm have made their lords and masters kiss the dust beneath their feet. The Koran permits a man to have four wives at a time, but a Muslim usually marries only one unless he is rich enough to provide a separate house for others. Of course, this only refers to the townsmen. Hard as it may be to believe, it is nevertheless true that the average Muslim actually finds it difficult to get along peacefully with four wives all under the same roof. The Quran also conveniently permits him to have as many concubines and slave girls as his right hand can hold. Mohammed himself is said to have had eleven wives and several concubines, and although it may be difficult for a stream to rise higher than its source, it is nevertheless a fact that among the more intelligent city dwellers of today, polygamy, concubinage, and slavery are dying out. King Hussein, King Faisal, Amir Ali, and the Sultan Abdullah of Transjordania, and most of the prominent present-day leaders in Arabia, have but one wife each. An Arab woman can be divorced for not having a son. She not only can be, but frequently is. An Arab seldom speaks of a woman as his wife. He calls her the relative in my house, or the mother of my son Ali. Girl babies are usually not very welcome. But when a child is born, no matter what the sex, the first precaution taken is to protect the babe from the influence of the evil eye. This is done by hanging a charm about its neck. Mothers also have a prejudice against curly hair, and do everything possible to straighten out any stubborn kinks in a baby's locks. In some parts of the desert there is an unwritten law that if a girl is attacked by a man between sunrise and noon, the man shall be flogged severely. If between noon and sunset, he is merely fined. And if during the night, when all are supposed to be in their tents under the protection of their families, 
a man is not subject to punishment. A man usually marries between the ages of 20 and 24, and a woman any time after she is 12. Professional matchmakers in Arabia do not perform their services gratuitously and unsolicited, as they do in Europe and America. When a Muslim wants to take unto himself a helpmate, he hires the services of a matronly lady who is an arranger of marriages by profession. He pays a certain sum for his bride. How much is always a matter of spirited argument. He never sees his fiancée until after the orange blossoms and old shoes, and then it's too late. The bride's mother doesn't call in the neighbors and a professional dressmaker to study the trousseau patterns in vogue or the lady's own journal. She merely borrows a cashmere shawl for her daughter. One of the few careers open to a woman of the Near East today is that of acting as a professional mourner. Often the mourners wail for days, and the wail, which sounds like the cry of a lost soul, usually ends in a piercing shriek which makes your blood run cold. The customs of immediate burial often result in complications. There is a bizarre story told in Jeddah to the effect that a Scot, who was stationed there early in the war, passed away as a result of some mysterious malady. He was carried a short distance outside the city and buried in the sand near the shore, wrapped in nothing but a Union Jack. A few hours before the funeral, a boat left Jeddah Harbor, and it carried an official memorandum to the government in London telling the death of the officer. After the ceremony, the mourners were returning to the city when suddenly they heard shouts, and turning, were panic-stricken to see the corpse running toward them, swathed in the Union Jack. It seems that the Scot had merely been in a trance, and a few moments after he was buried in the loose sand, land crabs attacked him and brought him back to life. But not satisfied at letting the yarn go at this, they tell how the Scot was afterward arrested in London for impersonating himself when he called at his bank to cash a check. Between the nomad woman of the tents and the townswoman, there is even more difference than between a wiry desert patriarch and his corpulent city cousin. Townswomen are fat and white, while the Bedouin women are thin and tanned. Many Bedouin sheiks have four wives at a time. Some of the richest chieftains have as many as fifty wives during a lifetime, but never more than four at once. One reason why they go so frequently indulge themselves the luxury of three or four is because it means easier housework. The Bedouin women all live in the same tent, too, and strangely enough, jealousy is uncommon. They do not regard a husband as exclusive property as we do. Bedouin women are much more ignorant and prejudiced than their menfolk, and they spend no small part of their time urging the men to fight. It is they who keep the century-old blood feuds alive. The desert nomads have no way of marking time. No Sundays. No Mondays. No 1924s and no 1925s. They are born. It is the will of Allah. Then they grow up, and after a while they die. It is the will of Allah. That is all there is to it. It is the will of Allah. So it isn't bad form to ask a bit of a woman her age, for she doesn't know whether she is sweet sixteen or a Mrs. Methuselah. They are all frightfully talkative, and whenever we were seated on the men's side of the thin partition which divides the goat's hair home of a Bedouin sheik, talking about western customs, such as women walking along city streets unveiled, or attending the theater in company with a gentleman friends, or playing golf. His wives would pop their heads up over the partition and remark, How disgusting! How vulgar! How beastly! Despite the example set by the Arabs themselves, Colonel Lawrence scrupulously avoided free talk about women. It is as difficult a subject as religion. On one occasion, when seated in Sheik Auda Abu Tayyi's tent, Lawrence was in an unusually talkative frame of mind and was giving his host a racy description of cabaret life in London. Every few minutes, Auda would slap his knee and roar, By Jove, I wish I were there. Then his wives would break in and upbraid him bitterly. The Bedouin women usually retain their beauty until their thirties, but after that, they are all short and thin. They take all their pleasures in their tents. The Bedouin women of the desert are not veiled, but they tattoo their faces and paint their lips blue. On all occasions, they wear a garment of dark blue cotton and keep their hair covered. Mohammed objected to women exposing their hair in public. 
All Arabs are fond of buying pearls or trinkets of hammered gold for their women. Some of their wives wear gold ornaments worth a thousand pounds or more. According to the unwritten law of Arabia, all ornaments are the personal property of a woman, and if divorced, she keeps them. If an Arab wants to divorce his wife, he simply says three times before witnesses, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. Consequently, all the women are foresighted enough to insist on having their possessions in portable form. The training of the Bedouin women is entirely in their tents. They spend much of their time milking their camels and goats and making butter. To do the latter, they get the milk and curds, which they squeeze in their hands and put on the tent roofs until all the moisture drops out. When it dries, it becomes as hard as a rock. In fact, their butter is so hard that it will even turn the edge of a knife. Lawrence would pulverize it between stones and mix it with water until it resembled malted milk. Many Bedouins regard women as the source of all evil and say that hell is full of them. The verses of a few desert poets breathe hatred for women rather than love. Here is a verse from one of Sir Richard Burton's translations. They said, Mary, I said I am free. Why take unto my bosom a sackful of snakes? May Allah never bless womankind. It is a simple matter for a Bedouin woman to clean house or move. The tribe leaves one bit of the desert as soon as the pasturage in the vicinity is exhausted. The more aristocratic Bedouins have neither sheep nor goats, only camels and horses. They limit themselves to the least possible amount of possessions and refuse to be tied down to any one spot. They have the fewest wants and are the freest of all the people of the earth. Sheikh Nuri Shalon once asked to be told something about European customs. Well, if you come to my house in England, said Lawrence, my women will serve you with tea. Whereupon Nuri clapped his hands for one of his wives, ordered her to make tea, and invited Lawrence into the women's quarters to drink it, an act entirely contrary to the unwritten law of the desert. The Bedouins are exceedingly courteous. And no matter how appalling your Arabic, they will never presume to correct you. When you call it a Bedouin tent, you make all of your polite speeches right away. And then when you leave, you may get up and brush off without saying a word of farewell. I had seen Bedouins call on Lawrence in his tent when he was reading. He would greet them, and then they would crouch down on their heels and he would resume his book. After a while, they would get up and silently walk out. But Lawrence himself would never leave so long as a guest was there. Al-Ghazali, the great theologian of Islam of the 11th century, said, Marriage is a kind of slavery. The wife becomes the slave of her husband. And it is her duty, absolutely, to obey him in everything he requires of her, except in what is contrary to the laws of Islam. Wife-beating is allowed by the Koran. All female slaves taken in war may become the private property of the man who wins them. There is an old tradition that a lie is excusable in three circumstances. In war, to reconcile friends, and to women. To the average Arab, heaven is an oasis with date palms, sparkling fountains, and racing camels, where every male angel may have as many concubines as he desires. So is it any wonder that the Arab and the Turk are splendid fighters when we realize that if they die in battle against the unbeliever, they will go direct to such a paradise? In that land of romance and mystery, of palm trees, camels, and veiled women, custom founded on the teachings of the Prophet relegates the gentler sex to an inferior position, not only in this world, but in the hereafter as well. <clears throat> but despite this, there are many Arabs who make love just as ardently as their enslaved brethren in other lands, and nearly all Arabian poets draw their inspiration from the loveliness of woman. My heart is firmer than the roots of mountains, my fame pervasive as the smell of musk. My pleasure is in hunting the wild lion, the beast of prey I will visit in his den. Yet all the while a gentle fawn has snared me, a heifer from the pastures of Kazan.